And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast live from the floor of Staples Center, where we just witnessed a pretty damn fun potential first-round preview between the New Orleans Pelicans and the Los Angeles Lakers, and I'm thrilled to be joined for an instant reaction podcast as they are lighting up the floor after the game by of the athletic John Hollinger. How are you? Doing great. Great great to be joining the pod again. Parachuting into Los Angeles on your travels across the basketball world. Um, what struck you most? First of all, do you think this is going to be a first-round matchup? I do. I mean, the Pelicans still have work to do, but... Their last 15 games are so soft, and most of their competition has comparatively difficult schedules and faces some injury issues. So I think things are definitely in their favor. They still have some work to do, but I think ultimately this will be the 1-8 matchup. Portland lost tonight to Boston. Sneakily, Portland, San Antonio, New Orleans came into tonight all tied in the loss column, and a lot of attention has been paid to New Orleans' easy schedule, but the second and third easiest schedules in the West are Portland and San Antonio. So if we're counting in New Orleans, we kind of have to count those two teams in. Memphis feels like they're kind of teetering with the Jaron Jackson injury. I would agree with that. And they have a very difficult schedule coming and, up. And road heavy. 538 coming into tonight had the Pelicans at a 68% chance to make the playoffs. That feels about right. Mm-hmm. This is a good team. Yeah. So what struck you about this potential head-to-head matchup? What did we learn now that Zion is involved and LeBron and Zion go at each other for the first time? You know, I still think both teams have to figure out kind of who are their guys when they get into a fourth quarter. I think you saw that with both of them. There were some kind of odd moments. Like the Pelicans were still at Derek Favors out there when they were kind of losing with two minutes left down 10, and they were – Still going, going kind of very big and no and Lonzo, slow. no Lonzo, no Lonzo for a while, and no Melly, who has kind of opened up a lot of things offensively. Like I thought, the Melly with Zion combo was probably their best look offensively with that front court. And then on the Lakers side, LeBron made a bunch of threes tonight. But you watch his team, and you still wonder sometimes if they have enough shooting when they get to a playoff series, and who they're going to turn to down the stretch of games. I mean, Caruso was really good again tonight. But he's, he's a guy you can lay off of when you get in a half-court game. Are they going to play big with Dwight and JaVale in the middle? Or are they going to go with well, now the And five? now you've thrown in this Markeith Morris variable where they played Morris, Kuzma, and a center. Morris, Kuzma, and LeBron. Morris, LeBron, and a center, I think, a little bit tonight. So they're clearly trying to fit. Like, I don't really know why Markeith Morris gets to walk in here and get, like, major rotation minutes. But um, particularly, it, it, I think it's clear now, like, Caruso has to play. Caruso, like, yeah. is coming into these games – with seven minutes left in the second quarter is like the last guy in the rotation. He comes in, and tonight he completely changed the game. It's Yeah, it's instant impact. It's uh, you, you have to wonder what, you know, some of these teams, they go with the lineup the whole year, then as soon as they lose a playoff game, they make all their adjustments and kind of go to their real best lineup. Like, how long do they ride with, like, Avery Bradley and Rajon Rondo playing a bunch of minutes before Caruso ever gets in the game? Rondo, I think, is the one where it's feast or famine. In their last game, Rondo was was really, really good, and tonight was eh. I think, you know, the Pelicans are the Pelicans are a good team. Since Zion's come back, they just have a lot of good players. They're a good team. I think they're, like, you 18 know what, and though? 10 in their last 28. Here's one for you. In their last 15 games that Zion didn't play... They're still good. They're eleven and four. Yeah, they're, that's what I mean. Like yeah. in their last thirty games, they're just a legit good team. Yep. Um, so the Lakers have the two best players in this matchup, mm-hmm. but the Pelicans have an All Star in Brandon Ingram who was cooking for the middle stretch of the game tonight. Slowed Absolutely. down in the fourth quarter, but was cooking. And Zion, who's a stud. And on any given night between those two, te- these two teams. One of those guys can play to the equal of or better of Anthony Davis. Like, like it's possible the Pelicans will have the second best guy on the floor because those two guys are that good. But what happened tonight was the best guy on the floor was just like, it was a superlative LeBron game and Drew Holiday, try as he might, there's just, he can't contain LeBron in the post. I think that's the issue that you saw when you get into a playoff series is what do they do to match up against LeBron because they, 
they they've used Holiday against bigger players a lot, and he usually can handle it. But this is one where he kind of can't. They tried hard on him, and uh, I think it's the same thing. He's just given up too many inches. So who do they have that they can put in that kind of matchup, or or what do they do? I don't know. Do they show a bunch of zone against him? I mean, we we saw it maybe a little bit tonight, but like, Clearly, is that something yeah. they need to go to more in, against a team like this? Clearly, Ingram is just too skinny. Hart, I think, is maybe the best body type for it that they have, but he doesn't start. He's not in their yeah. starting lineup. Or Kenrich Williams, who doesn't play at all. Now. I forgot Kenrich Williams existed until you just mentioned his name right now. Part of the power of the way the Lakers are built is that you would like to say, well, how about you try Zion on him? But then, like, who's going to guard Anthony Davis? And you just sort of trickle down from there. I thought Zion did, like, a pretty good job on Anthony Davis tonight. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I thought tactically the Lakers did that played into his hands a little bit, they were trying kind of direct post-ups for Davis against Zion, where because Zion has been able to rely so much on his athletic ability his whole career, his defensive fundamentals are actually really poor in in terms of, like, what he's doing off the ball and stuff. To me, you, he's just a guy you want to put in pick and rolls and put in actions and stuff and kind of get him having to – having to do more complicated things than than just muscle muscle up against AD one on one. That's that's the thing that he could do most effectively. Particularly like I've noticed second side actions give him a lot of trouble. So if he's in the first pick and roll, it's a high middle pick and roll, he sees it coming, he can prepare for it. He's fine. When there's one action that gets the floor moving a little bit and they swing it to his side and then he's involved in the pick and roll, often his like feet are out of position, he's taking bad angles and you know, but the, he's he's nineteen. He's a rookie. I thought he acquitted his, himself well and like the sheer number of spectacular plays and like attempted spectacular plays in this game, half of which involved Caruso, was yeah. really, really fun. Yeah, th- this was a wildly entertaining basketball game, as- especially honestly for this time of year when we, get- when the dud rate does <laughs> seem to increase. I mean, th- this this was re- the fans who came here got their money's worth. LeBron had a post up dunk on Drew Holiday's face. Caruso had the through the legs bounce pass back to LeBron for a dunk on Josh Hart's head. He got hard on head. that one. Yep. Uh, Caruso stole part of Lonzo Ball's soul with a block at the rim, and then had an and one at the other end. And then, like every time Zion touches the ball, it's just very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he had a spectacular play that didn't result in any points, but where he uh, out jumped Dwight Howard for an offensive rebound. You could just hear the crowd ooing and awing like they they. Just the sheer height he got off the floor when he's given up six inches to the guy was was so impressive. Well, and the play that I know the Pelicans coaches think once our guards get the timing, we can get this like literally eight times a game is the front Zion and the pull. Yep. Or not even front him. Just he spins towards the rim and you lob it up to him. And they tried it a bunch of times. AD got one. Like that's just that's just fun to watch, man. And Zion coming at you in transition is just he can get a little out of control. He can lose his handle a little bit. But he's just, he's so fast. And, like, this is the first time I've seen him up close. He's just so fast in tight spaces. It's, like, kind of astonishing. Yeah, it, it's funny because you see him, he just kind of ambles up the court and he looks heavy. I mean, he's he's probably got to be, like, 20 pounds over what his ideal weight should be right now. And yet still, like, the second the ball hits his hands, it's just like, zoop. It's, a, it's not like getting ahead of steam. He, he doesn't need to get ahead of steam. Like, he just goes. The acceleration is instant. He had a play where he was coming down in transition, and it was toward me on press row. And Markeith Morris smacked his arm so loud and so hard that you could probably have heard the slap a hundred rows back in the crowd. And Zion just went right through it like it wasn't even there and, like, missed the shot. So Markeith Morris did his job. And then I was like, God, that, like, hurt me hearing it. And Zion yeah. just kind of, like, looked at his arm and, like, wiped it a little <laughs> bit and like, went to shoot the free throws. It was, like, no impact at all. It was it was amazing when Morris was guarding him how fi- – like, Markeith Morris is big, right? Like, how physically overmatched he was against Zion. Like, there was one play he had to bear hug him. He get, There was one spin-out dunk, like – it was it was kind of a mismatch. It was like, wow. <laughs> At the same time, AD's length, it was an interesting duel when he would attack AD or Dwight, or Dwight one-on-one. Yeah. Sometimes his speed and power would give him just enough space, like they're backpedaling to get a little floater. But AD's length gave him some problems. Like that's, But like for a 19-year-old in his, what, 10th, 11th, 12th game, whatever it is, uh, I thought he was like totally belonged on the floor with all those guys. Not surprisingly, given how he's played so far. Oh, I, absolutely. And really, I mean, when you think of how many things there are that he can still get better at, 
in terms of not just his conditioning, but in terms of his skill level, his right hand, his shot. I mean, you, you shudder to think what the ceiling could be for him if they can keep him on the floor. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I don't think it was like a real decision for them at the trade deadline because I don't think they got an offer that was worth really doing anything with Drew Holiday. But I, I don't know what the tipping point was, but I erred on the side of if you can get a really good haul for Drew Holiday, I think you should do it because it aligns it aligns those those assets will align time wise with Zion better than Drew Holiday does. But this team's got a chance to be pretty good, like right now and next season. Like I, that, I can see why it was a tough decision for them. I don't know what you would have done or what the tipping point would have been, but it's a harder decision now having seen this team play fully formed than I conceived of it then, because they're they're good. Yeah. I th- I think the tipping point for them is more what what are they getting back? I think more like a right now asset, like somebody who's 22 and is already in the league, as opposed to. A first round pick in 2023. Right. I, I, I think that's the thing that maybe provides the tipping point for and them. Those guys they, are... They'll have chances again this summer. I mean, we were in that exact same situation in Memphis with Mike Conley where we had some offers on the table at the, at the trade deadline in 2019, but we knew we'd probably be able to face better offers when the draft came up in the off season and teams more had their ducks in a row. And, you know, you can do more trades in the off season. You don't have to cut players and manage rosters and all that. It's, it's just a little easier. Yeah, you know, Gary Harris just being almost a negative asset on that contract really changed the trade market because if he had been, if you could talk yourself into he's exactly the kind of player you described, he's 20 yep. whatever, on the upswing, really reliable skill set that fits and like something just, you know, didn't has not been happening for him in the last year and a half really and and I just think Denver looked at that or uh, New Orleans looked at that contract like are we sure that he's a trade asset? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because that because Holiday would have been the piece for the Nuggets that would have fit absolutely perfectly. Although you could argue if Gary Harris had been playing well, it would have said, "Well, What's, we don't need yeah. <laughs> we don't need Drew Holiday." Uh, yeah, I, you know, I just think the upside with Drew defensively is a little higher than Gary, even the peak version of Gary. But Gary will get hot. I mean, his shooting will turn around. This is weird how poorly he's been um, he's been shooting. It, to me, the interesting piece is what you mentioned, which is like. When and how does New Orleans get a better version of Melly? Because Melly's Melly's decent. He has mm-hmm. a decent little floor game. Moves his feet a little better than people think on defense. Can like make the next pass on offense. But like just in terms of athleticism and speed, there's a pretty hard ceiling there that the playoffs are going to expose. Yep. But it's very clear that Zion plus spacing is that going to be incredibly powerful. Yeah. So if they can get somebody who's more on. Uh, I'll throw Memphis in here again. Marcus Saul's level, who, you know, where he was with Toronto last year, where he's up at the top of the key, and then, you know, he's in that Zion's in that Siakam role where he has free reign to go down the middle and do whatever off the dribble because there's no bigs in there. I, I'm. It, it would be interesting to see how how much more New Orleans leans into their other version of that is just Zion and no other bigs on the floor. So like Lonzo, Drew, Hart, Ingram, Zion. That lineup should be very good. Defensively, it doesn't have enough size, doesn't have enough oomph. But, like, Zion in open space as a roll man in transition, posting up dudes, it's facing up, facing up, going to the rim is is just re- – and he's a really good passer. That's the thing that I think has surprised me as someone who didn't watch him much of Duke is his passing is really good. Yeah. And, you know, what's scary is that having seen him in preseason, like, he's, he's not at the level – even tonight – Athletically, that he was in the preseason, like he 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 still has <laughs> he still has another level to get to as he recovers from this uh, setback he had with his knee. And even so, um, he looks sometimes like he's surprised by how high he is and how fast he's gotten that. Like he goes up to like a routine dunk, two handed routine two handed dunk, and his eyes are at the rim. He's doing a chin up on the rim. Like oh wow, that was yeah. that was fast. What was your, like, walk-off, we just won a game song in Memphis that they would play in the arena? Like, here for the Lakers, it's I Love L.A. What Did, did you have one in Memphis? I yeah. wanted. I want to do a story on all thirty of these, and who has like I want to rank them one to thirty because I think. How do I not know what our what our what our? Because uh... Ben, so it's, I was at the Clippers game last night, and this has been because the, but... the song I always remember was like when we would make the basket to put the game away, then they would play the gap band. But I, I don't remember. 
I don't remember what our walk-off song was. How do I not remember that? So the Clippers, I think it's a, a little interesting subset into the Clippers-Lakers duel. I, very, if I ranked the top 30 of these, I bet these would both be in the top five. I love LA as the Lakers. Yep. California love by Tupac is, is the Clippers. And they blare that first California when there's like 10 seconds left in the game. Like it comes before the buzzer. All of a sudden it's California. Very cool. Very good duel. I need to, I need to do more research on this. And both, it's, both it's, songs it's, like represent perfectly the two respective franchises and the kind of identities that they have. Yeah. It, it's, this it's, is what I spend time thinking about. I, I, see, I thought, I thought there was like, I, th- I thought mascots occupied a bigger portion of your brain than this. We I- talked about G Wiz, the Washington Wizards mascot, on uh, Rachel's show, The Jump, today, because Robin Lopez uh, and the Bucks WWE routine uh-huh. last night targeted G Wiz. Frankly, with the cheap shot, they took the WWE belt and Giannis hit him over the head with it when he wasn't looking, which <laughs> is grounds for disqualification. But poor G Wiz. Who's not even like a, I don't even know what he is. He's like some sort of gonzo-ish wizard creature. Didn't yeah. that, he didn't ask for that. He's just trying to have a nice time and entertain some children and he gets plowed over. Um, speaking of, let's, let's do two minutes on this. What's wrong with the jazz? You brought up Conley and, and I know this is painful for you as, as a Grizz guy, but I mean, it, it, what it, they've had the weirdest season where they won like 15 out of 16 or whatever the hell they won. Yeah. And now they've lost like, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but like 13 out of whatever, 18 or something like that. And, they, and they've had some bad ones in there. I mean, they lost 13 out of 18 losing, is exaggerated, but they had a five game losing streak and now they have like, 20, now they have like a four Phoenix gamer. Raises some eyebrows, certainly. Yeah, it's like they have a rule they can only have one left-handed player be good in the same game. When when Conley is good, Ingles is not. When Ingles is good, Conley is not. They have trouble getting them both both going. And they don't have a real four there. They never they the whole question with the construction of this was how how's it going to work at the forward spots? And are they putting too much pressure on Gobert to just defend the whole team and get every rebound and I think some of those questions are starting to come to light now again. I just look at them. I see two things. Number one, you, you know it when you see it in the NBA when a team has an identity, when everyone feels comfortable with the style of play and their role in it, and, and it's just like this team stands for this. You know it when you see it. Yeah. Utah doesn't quite have that. They're caught like on offense. They're kind of like caught in between. The old Quinn Snyder, like there's 17 passes and a million screens and everything's, they call it the blender, like putting guys in the blender. And like, let's simplify it and run high pick and roll and be a little more predictable because we have more high end talent now, like Mike. They're like caught in between identities. And then on defense, this was my worry about them after the trades they, and the, and the free agency with Bogdanovich and stuff. I remember saying this, that they're a little bit soft is not the right word. But just a little lacking in the kind of like, just length athleticism. I just called it like oomph. Just like guys that when they're coming at you, you're like, ugh, that guy's cool. That's kind of you're, you're not pulling the ball down when you see one of their guys come running at you on the closeout. It was like yeah. how the Thunder got better in the playoffs, particularly against the Warriors, because the Warriors were this super skilled shooting team, and the yeah. Thunder were like, we just got a bunch of long dudes who will jump in your face, and yeah. it freaked the Warriors out. Well, they the did Jets, that against the Spurs a couple times, too. Same I mean, deal. They, yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the Jazz just don't, like, they're just not that, like, long, and they don't have that kind of ferocious athleticism, enough of it, that you need. But I still think there's a really good team in there. I have faith that they'll figure some stuff out, but I think one of the hard questions they're going to ask is, like, is Mike Conley really our starting point guard? Or do we need to go back to where Mike is coming off the bench? I don't know the answer I to think, that. But the numbers suggest that their current starting lineup is like minus six per 100 possessions. Yeah, I think getting getting Royce O'Neal back in that starting group, too, I think will help them get a little more defensive oomph. I mean, even though he's a little, he's a little smaller, too, but he's the best defender of that group. And they use him at every position. Like, they had him on Devin Booker last night in Phoenix. They used him all over the place. Um, one last thought, a couple last thoughts on tonight's game, which was just, LeBron was just, LeBron is having, is it a, is it a race for MVP? I can't really see it as a race. I don't, no? I, I, I kind of want it to be a race. If, Gian, if Giannis was in LA and LeBron was in Milwaukee, would we be having this discussion at all? It's a fair point. It's a fair question. I, I, I just think like they're they're fifty and eight, and he's the best player in the league. Like, what is what is there to talk about? And he, yeah, and his, the gap on defense, 
And you can say that some of that gap is explained by LeBron saving himself for whatever is going to happen in the playoffs. And I don't really know how much he's saving, honestly, mm-hmm. like maybe 30 to 40 possessions uh, against an elite guy. 50, I don't know. Like how often is he going to guard Kawhi? I don't know that that's going to be yeah. a huge number of possessions. Maybe I'm wrong. But um, that number is pretty close to zero in the regular season. Right. Like they just don't ever let him guard anybody. And good. that's ultimately what, what we're rewarding uh, is is this season's worth of play. Uh, one thing that we saw a little bit of that I'm always curious when teams play the Lakers, it was in the first half, they put Zion for like four or five possessions on JaVale McGee, and they put favors on Anthony Davis. And I, I always wonder how teams go through these matchups like, okay, do we want to put our center on Anthony Davis to neutralize this post game and put a smaller guy. They did it with Hart. Uh, they did it with Ingram a couple of times. Put a smaller guy on JaVale McGee. Right. And sort of rejigger the matchups that way. And it's such an interesting calculation because immediately JaVale McGee starts getting offensive rebounds. And B, when you put your center on Anthony Davis, depending on who that center is, you have now weaponized the LeBron Davis pick and roll more than it is when it's a three and a four guarding it. Because if there's a five on Anthony Davis, all of a sudden you can't switch it. And there's right. all sorts of stuff. I just think that calculation is very interesting. You can see the Pelicans doing it. And I bet when we get into the playoffs, we're going to see every Lakers opponent experiment with that exact matchup strategy. And I think the place they're all going to end up is is if you want to, if you want to post up Anthony Davis against us, go nuts. We'll live with that rather than the other stuff. That could very well be where teams end up, and he uh, his post numbers are are good. If you look at his tracking numbers and his points per possession, they're good. But almost nobody gets to the point where like that's a functional good NBA offense all by itself. Like it's good relative to other post players. Yeah, it's not good relative to like a LeBron spread pick and roll. Well, especially I mean, if you know that's coming, you scheme for it a little again. There's not a ton of shooting here. Especially when Danny Green isn't on the floor, and they, so you can do stuff to shrink to shrink the floor even against that. That's I what I was I, getting at when I was talking about the star quotient of this matchup. Is like once you get by the the, the this is this is very obvious, but the, once you get past the two Lakers' best players, the who, gap between these rosters is not significant at all, and may actually favor the Pelicans. So if on a game by game basis. They get Zion plus Ingram or Zion plus Holiday gets you to 90% of the production of LeBron and AD. You're going to have a chance in every game. Like, I think this would be, I think the Lakers win this series, obviously, but I think it's a fun competitive series. Yeah. I, I would be surprised if it ended up being a sweep, certainly. So five, six games, something like that. Pelicans are fun, man. Before the season, when we looked at this lineup, they're currently starting of Lonzo, Drew, Ingram, Zion favors. You wondered. Boy, that's not a lot of shooting at all. That's not enough shooting. And Lonzo is now a, a league average to slightly above average three-point shooter. Is that real? We'll see. Mm-hmm. Ingram is at 40% and holding yep. steady. Yep. So that kind of question has been answered positively for them. And they just have this identity of they're, they're so fast. They play so fast. And all four out of those five guys are really skilled off the dribble quick decision playmakers and that can make up for like a lack of spacing like when everyone on your team can get through those little tight corridors they play a really fun style yeah yeah like you say they're fast in transition and they're fast even after made baskets and and they don't need a lot of space and the other thing is i mean they haven't really fully weaponized jj reddick yet when you talk about spacing with them it's a great point because you can see i mean part of the thing about zion is He's created some interesting minutes decisions now where guys are getting squeezed. Like Etwan Moore, did he even play he in the played second four half? Four minutes. Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't think he played at all in the second half. He got he got a little bit of run in the first half. And um, JJ's had games where he's playing like 15 minutes. Yep. Which is yep. probably not enough. But they're a good team and their speed, like the Lakers will go through in games where they're not super psyched about transition defense. Obviously, that's the number one thing you can solve flipping the switch to the playoffs. But you really got to solve it against the Pelicans on every single possession, even after makes. Yeah, absolutely. And the Pelicans, we should point out, transition defense has not been a highlight for them this year either. For the first month of the season, it was almost as if they were intentionally granting the other team <laughs> baskets. Practicing four on three drills. Yeah. yeah. All right, John Hollinger, let's wrap up and we can we can go catch up with people in the locker room. Thanks for doing a little quickie pod with me after Lakers Pelicans, Zion LeBron. Read all of John's stuff at the Athletic. What do we have coming? Well, let's see. <laughs> okay. I got <laughs> No, I got I I actually I do, I 
I do have something coming on uh, Luca here in the next couple of days. Luca, yeah, that's uh, exciting. Just and Dallas, you just, so that that should be speaking that, of that Luca. You also just wrote about Mark Cuban and officiating, so yes. everyone should check that out and check out everything John reads. He's the best. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. The Low Post is presented by Goodyear. Drive always discovers possibilities. Goodyear, more driven.